welcome back to What the Fat. Um, I hope you guys have been enjoying all of the amazing episodes we've had and all the special guests we've had thus far. Um, but today we have someone who's an incredible guest and someone who's got a book coming very soon that we'll talk about later on. And that is Christina Kerp. Is it Kerp? Yeah, yes. and and you guys probably know her as she's at the Castaway Kitchen. Literally the most amazing recipes I've ever come across. I like drool every time I, I see her page, and she's been someone I've been following for a very long time, and just love the information, recipes, and content that she's been putting out. So, Christina, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction, Ryan, and thanks for having me. <laughs> oh, absolutely. So. Can you just give everyone, if they don't already know you, they should, but if they don't know you yet, um, give them a little background on yourself growing up and kind of let the entire world know who you are and what you've done. Okay. So I have no pressure. Um, <laughs> so I have, so yeah, I blog at the Castaway Kitchen, but many, before I even knew what a blog was, I was a restaurant chef for many years. Um, so before that, I majored in sociology and anthropology with a focus on like research methods and applied that to market research. But in my early 20s, found myself really uninspired by that work because it was very corporate hustle, um, big brands and all that, but nothing, it wasn't feeding my soul. And so left that and started working for my mom who owns a restaurant in Miami. And I ended up working in the kitchen one day because the chef was out because his baby was sick. And next thing you know, it's like, I mean, this is a really busy, small restaurant, but it's all farm to table health food. And I kind of crushed it. And she was like, you're good at that. Do you want to learn how to do that? And I was like, yeah. So I stayed working in the kitchen and kind of was like mentored by her chef and like her awesome staff there. And later on, when I moved to San Diego, because in the middle of all that, I met a guy at a bar in Miami, you know, it's Miami, <laughs> and we fell in love and got married, and he was in the Navy, so ended up in San Diego, worked on a biodiesel fuel food truck that was, like, farm-to-table. We would do, like, concerts, Coachella, all these festivals, farmer's markets, and worked my way up to executive chef and started doing pop-up dinners, and we would cater weddings and, like, all this crazy, like, high-end food out of a food truck. It was wild. Um, but I really fine tuned my skills there. Um, I had a baby and um, became a stay at home mom and moved to Hawaii because of the military and found myself really sick after I was like postpartum. My autoimmune issues, which I didn't even know they were autoimmune, I kind of just always thought that like I had shitty luck with health and I just had to deal with it. But I think when you become a parent, it's a really good motivator to be a better version of yourself. And that's when I was like, okay, I have to do better for myself because I have a kid now and I want to be healthy. So I started looking into ways to be healthy and food. I always knew food was important, but I didn't know how, right? Cause even you can eat organic and you can eat vegan, but I was still doing a lot of grains and sugar and stuff. Right. And so I found paleo because I found a, a article on Rob Wolf's website and um, the talk that specifically about my autoimmune disease, which is a skin condition, hydrogenitis superativa. So I was like, I can do paleo. I know what that is, right? I was in San Diego. Like we know all the health food stuff. And I started kind of dabbling in that. Um, and I was like, my friends, like you should blog about it. Like your food is so good. Like post your recipes online. And I was like, what's a blog? <laughs> I have no <laughs> idea. But I learned, I did it. And it kind of became an obsession. Like I loved sharing it. I love the online community. And through the online community, really, like, through followers and other people I follow, I learned about Whole30s, and then I learned about the autoimmune protocol, and then I learned about keto, and I just, it was this whole new world opened up, it was like this magical place where people heal through food, and they question, you know, conventional medicine, and they're, then they work out a lot, and it was like, whoa, where have these people been all my life? Um, so yeah, I never turned back, I just went down the troubleshooting food as medicine rabbit hole and never came out. Um, and because of my chef skills, I've been able to create really fun recipes no matter what roadblock I hit. I was like, I can cook around that. And I have, and that's kind of become my niche. I'm known for like keto, but AIP, nut free, dairy free, nightshade free. Like you can't eat something. I can make the food taste good no matter what. Um, I love it. 
and it's been an amazing journey, but it's been, it's been rad. Yeah. I love it. And your journey is so inspiring because your parents came over from Cuba, right? Um, they, they kind of brought you over and, and in Cuban culture in general, I have a lot of Cuban friends and like, eating is a big part of that culture. So like, did that play an impact into kind of like some of the trials and tribulations you faced early on? Absolutely. For one, we have a very like emotional connection with food. Um, because you grow up always hearing we didn't have this or we didn't have enough. You had to eat your, you had to eat all your food growing up. Like God forbid you left a bite on your, you know, a food on your plate. So the whole listening to your body thing <laughs> did not, did not matter. You were eating every last bite because children are starving in Cuba. Or when I grew up, we didn't even have food, right? And so that plays into it. And also, um, you know, there's the rice and the beans and the plantains and the yuca and the tamales. And just so it's, it was definitely, I mean, pastelitos, oh my gosh. Like it's just, yeah, it's, you feel like you're going to lose your cultural identity a little bit um, when you change your way of eating. But what I've learned is that like everything in life, it's about perspective. And so I've been able to recreate traditional Cuban dishes, keto, you know, and I've been able to maintain my cultural identity, um, even though I've changed my lifestyle and hopefully inspire people, um, like my family and like, and the people in the Latin community to do the same, because you don't have to let go of your, you know, your culture just to change the way you're eating. You know, you can oh, make it. I love that. Yeah. That's so important because I have so many friends that are like, I can never give up my rice and beans. Like, it's, it's never, it's never possible. And I'm like, try, I got the perfect person for you to follow. Like every, and yeah. the amazing thing about it is, you are that person that, like, if you walk into a, a kitchen and there's a piece of pepperoni, some olives, and like bacon, you'll figure out something that's like some cool creation to like make. Yes. That. I yeah. love that. I love that. Yeah, so, ever since I was young, I could I was really creative in the kitchen and I think in college, you know, college, come on, every apartment, like I didn't live in a dorm, but I lived in my apartment with my friends and my roommates and the fridge was a sad sad statement most of the time, but I could always put dinner on the table. I love that. I love that. And so when so you got diagnosed with this autoimmune disease uh, slash skin condition, what what right. age did that kind of happen? That was when I was like a, a teenager. It was like 13, 14 years old, which was awful because that age is difficult anyway. And then in Miami more so because like it's Miami and you know, you're in Tampa. So, you know, it's like super hot and people are naked all the time. Right. Um, and so that, but no one told me it was autoimmune. They were like, you just have the skin condition. Here's some like steroid cream and anti like antibiotics, like good luck that they didn't like offer long-term solutions. They never mentioned diet. Never, never. Even after I saw improvement through elimination diets, I had a doctor tell me it was just, you know, it's just coincidence. Wow. I was like, okay. Wow. And at the same yeah, time, they don't, they don't acknowledge. And, and at the same time you were struggling with weight challenges, right? Growing up, you said you, in your book, you talked a little life. bit about struggling with weight. And so that compiled yes. with, the skin condition is like what really, so Rob Wolf's website is really what kind of made the turn for you where you're like, I want to try doing this through nutrition. Yeah, definitely. So I was overweight my whole life. I mean, ever since I was a baby, I don't have memories of not being overweight when I was younger or ever. Like my, both my sisters are skinny or like never struggled with weight. And I, it's weird because when I look back now and for what I know now of leaky gut and metabolic, metabolic you know, issues, I had it all. I was that kid with ear, nose, and throat infections. I had constipation. I had like fatigue. I was just, I was on, I was sick all the time. My immune system was compromised since I was a baby. We just didn't know. And, you know, of course, it could have been a number of things. It could have been a C section birth. It could have been soy formula. It could have been, you know, being on antibiotics. At like eight months old, I was hospitalized with pneumonia. Like it, you know, number of things, right? Interesting, yeah. And of course, you know, back then it was like the pediatrician would tell, the, tell my mom, like, put what is it rice cereal in her formula bottle <laughs> like they would they they gave some really crazy advice back then <laughs> and so growing up with that it was just this like mystery of like why I had all these struggles that my sisters didn't and of course it like weighed on my self-esteem and then you go into the yo-yo dieting and I mean I did 
the Weight Watchers and the South Beach diet. In my 20s, I took like those crazy diet pills that were like crack or like, you know, Miami diet, as they call it, where you like drink coffee all day and then eat a salad for lunch and then you drink booze all night, all <laughs> right. those things. Right. And so um, I was always on these really unhealthy, like up and downs. And like, yeah, in my, you know, when I was younger, I would see those quick results, right? Like I'd lose 20 pounds really fast, but I'd always gain it back. And I was never healthy. I never liked to work out. I would try and put, you know, do the treadmill and sweat and be bored and hate it. But it was such an unhealthy relationship. Like food was never this positive thing. It was like I either felt guilt because I ate it or I felt like shit because I hated what I was eating. So I was just trying to get lose weight. Um, but when I found this article, Tara Grant, whose title is Primal Girl, and she wrote The Hidden Plague, which is a book specifically on my skin condition, because she has it too. And Rob Wolf had her do a guest post on his blog about it. And thank goodness for SEO and Google Juice. You know, when I typed up, you know, food to heal HS or I tried your tinnitus, it came up. And I was like, <gasps> you know, mind blown. And one of the things she talked about was nightshades. And I didn't even know, like, really that it was a thing. Like, what do you mean? But they're vegetables. I love tomatoes. I love eggplant. I eat them all the time. It's healthy. Um, but making that correlation that I could, it was, it was so empowering to finally feel in control of this, like, affliction. To be like, what do you, hold on. I can do something about this? That was just an amazing feeling. That's awesome. And I love the concept because... Uh, last week I had someone, I had Sean Wells on here who talked a little bit about like a doctor who literally changed their entire, his entire perspective on life and his entire path. And for you, it literally took one guest blog post, right? And I think that's why it's so important for like what you're doing, right? With the blog, like, and, and I see that all the time and what we're doing even with this podcast, like I just want to highlight people who are doing amazing things in, in the space, but also there might be someone who's listening to this that has no idea that there's there's a solution out there, or there's an opportunity for them to improve. And if they hear this, like, completely transform their life, that's why I think it's so empowering. Absolutely. I was, it was, I mean, so my skin condition, it's embarrassing. Like, people don't like talking about it. And that's one of the big things. Lots of people have it. No one talks about it. Some people don't even go to the doctors. And so um, what I remember when I finally got, like, the courage to share it on my blog, I think I titled the post something about, like, coming out, like, my big secret. Um <laughs> And I had people calling me, like friends of mine that I've known me my whole life. They were like, I had no idea. You know, I had like an ex and like a boyfriend who was like, how did I not know this? And I'm like, <laughs> it literally made it my job to like hide this shit. And so it was exhausting. And, I, and, and then a lot of people were like, oh, my God, I have it too. Or, you know, and the emails, the import of emails of thank you so much. I can't believe it. Like I, reading your story, it's like, it's my, it's like reading my own life and. Um, and I've really just become really vocal about it because the more I share, the more I talk about it, the more people can help. That's amazing. That's amazing. And is that really what inspired you to start a blog and then now really write a book, which we'll get into in a little bit? Like, is that really what started? Is that like your why to really try and get this information out there? Absolutely. Being the, because the skin condition, and I did put it into remission through lifestyle and diet changes, huge win. But I will say that the most amazing thing is how my life has transformed in every aspect. Like the way I feel about myself and my body, the positivity in my life, um, the, the energy I have. Like it's been the most transformative three years of my life. And the, and I lived so long kind of like, I don't know, this subpar life. I think I was living my life at like 30%, right? And all of a sudden I'm at 100%. And I'm like, oh my gosh. There's so many people out there and they're at 30% and they don't know. They don't know yet. They can get 100. And they, and once you're there, you're like, this is amazing. And everything is like, just life is so much better. And your relationships are so much better and everything. And I want people to feel that. And the key, not everything. Food isn't always the answer, but it's a damn good starting point. And I just I want to spread it. I want to spread it. I love that. I love that. And I think that's so true is you see so many people who are operating and, and walking around and they think they're close to their potential and they think they're operating at full capacity and they don't realize it until they really push past that barrier and knock down some of those walls and they're like whoa like I'm on the other end of this and there's a whole new spectrum of, of opportunity out here 
And that's amazing. Right. That's amazing. Um, so transitioning into like what got you interested in the keto specifically, you got, in, you heard from Rob Wolf, uh, that, that, and you went from gluten free to whole 30 to paleo to AIP. Like, what was that like? Like kind of what, what made you transition closer and closer and closer to keto? So I'm like the master troubleshooter. And I'm also, I think part of that, you kind of get hungry for, I I was so sick for so long that when I started feeling better, I became obsessed with the notion of like reaching my full potential. And I knew that I like, I had to keep going. Like there is no roadblock. I'm not going to be able to get around. And so, yeah, paleo was great, but I was still like feeling some fatigue and I was still not, you know, then I did AIP because of my inflammation, right? I thought, okay, anti-inflammatory foods, let's do that. I have inflammation. So I did the AIP, saw really good results. I love the autoimmune protocol. I'm a huge, huge elimination diet fan. And we can talk more about that later. But I think that you learn a lot about yourself, right? And so great, AIP helped me a lot, but I wasn't at 100% yet. I was kind of having some digestive issues. My hormones felt a little out of whack. I was having trouble losing weight. And so I was like, well, maybe I have small intestine bacteria overgrowth. Um, let me look into that and omit starches. And kind of researching in that like low starch paleo world, I ran into Mark Sisson's work and he's the primal blueprint, which is a very essentially a type of keto, right? Like a version of it. And so I did his program at the 21 day reset and I felt really great. And I was definitely back then still on the higher end of carbs. Like I was, my goal was under a hundred and I saw a good result, but again, I wanted more. I was like, this is good. I can be better. I can feel better. And that's when keto was, I heard, I had heard the word, but I felt like keto was not for me because I think when I saw a lot of the resources online, there was a lot of foods that I knew I couldn't eat like dairy and nightshades. Um, and so I don't know why in my head, I just didn't see it as an option until finally I just kept lowering my carbs and I was like, okay, like, I'm pretty sure this is what I'm doing now. <laughs> and so I read um, this book by Sky St. John on no fail fat burning for women. And I really liked that it was geared toward women. It's a little 72 page book, sort of like four or five years ago, but it was really great. You do a glycogen depletion and then, um, you know, she has, she has all the yes and no list. She's a big proponent of carb cycling. Um, so I did that. I did her program. And after I was done, I kind of dropped this carb cycling on my own for a while there because I think it was kind of inhibiting me into getting like fully fat adapted. And once I became fat adapted, it was like, what? I was, so I have ADHD. I was diagnosed in high school and I was on Adderall and all that back then. And I mean, I wrote a 432 page book in five months. So Obviously, I can focus now. Yeah. <laughs> it was like amazing. the mental clear. Yeah, the mental clarity once I became fat adapted, the way that my cravings went away, because on paleo, you like with the sweet potatoes and the maple syrup, paleo is great. And for a lot of people, it's great. For me, I was still overeating. I was still abusing food. And that's what I realized. Like, that's why I was having problems losing weight still or like getting to where I wanted to go because. I still had, I was still riding that sugar, that roller coaster, you know? And so I'd have those massive cravings and I was still doing way too many carbs and then I'd crash and then I was tired at three and, you know, the brain fog. And so, and then obviously, obviously I was insulin resistant, which I learned that as well, but, um, I would have not known like how I could feel without the carb dependency had it not been for keto. So it, it was it was great. Yeah. Keto was like what kind of gave me that major edge with, um, performance. And even like in the gym, like once I became fat adapted, like, Oh my gosh, my workouts just so much better, like lifting super heavy, um, and just so much energy. And I think your story is going to resonate with so many people because so many times, especially females, uh, think that they're kind of lost in this realm of like, I don't have any answers. There's no one to really help me. Like, and a lot of them are insulin resistant, whether it's dealing with PCOS or dealing with certain autoimmune conditions that unfortunately arise for a multitude of different reasons. So I really think that kind of transition. And I'm so glad that Rob, it's a great friend and like all these different people like yourself are starting these blogs for people to really get resources and information. Cause if they can hear one thing that can help them and give them a glimpse of hope, like that's powerful. Right. 
Um, for so, sure. And I want to I want to transition for you into really your keto life um, because it's okay. it's super interesting. You are you've you've went through the whole spectrum from like you said going through carb cycling to gluten free to whole thirty to paleo. So now in in a day mm -hmm. well I know you, you're moving you just got done moving but so it might be a little wacky and you're getting ready to go on a book tour but what does a day in the life look like for you like what's a typical eating pattern schedule look like okay so I'm a big proponent of intuitive eating and if you read my book you know that but I definitely a caveat to that I like I said I followed programs before right and so I became fat adapted I think you kind of have to like master something before you break the rule and I think that very much applies to keto. Like you can really have flexibility with it once you get it down pat. Like once you know the rules or you kind of learn it, you can then figure out how it best suits you. And that's kind of what I do. So my eating changes drastically from day to day because I don't, I don't follow set macros. So like one day I'm like, don't eat anything, just drink fatty coffee. And then the next day I could eat like a cow. And I, I do because I love protein. <laughs> yeah. And so... Um, and so for me, like one of the one of the trends I've definitely seen with my eating is that a lot of it has to do with my cycle. And I think for women, like we have to take into consideration our menstrual cycle with our nutritional needs, like hands down. You can't like if you're fighting against that, you're just going to hit roadblocks. And so um, I'm very much so a typical day. I wake up, drink water, with a pinch of salt. Um, and I usually like to like get, you know, do my morning routine lately. I've been into I'm writing my future bio which is like every morning I wake up and I write down my, my biography in five years, right? Like, you know, a little, like a little blurb. That's awesome. Um, which is like, manifest. yeah, it's a man manifestation exercise. And then I make coffee and I'm a super coffee snob. Oh my gosh. I like cold brews. I mean, not cold, but I like, so I do like cold brew, but I mostly do like, I like a light roast, single origin coffees, mold free. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I get in my French press, and then I usually add MCT oil to it. I do Ceylon cinnamon, which is good. Ceylon cinnamon is easier on your liver. Um, and sometimes I do coconut milk or cashew milk. And usually I just drink a cup or two of that until about noon. Um, I definitely feel best when I just do that in the morning. I don't do that well once, even if it's a even if it's a low carb, high fat meal. I notice that if I eat like a breakfast i'm just hungrier the rest of the day um so unless i wake up starving i just get breakfast um and then my first meal of the day i like to keep it really low carb because usually i have still a lot of stuff to do so it's usually like some greens some fat like i have a half an avocado and then like i love ground beef and i love doing you know, like lots of citrus um and i'll eat like a small salad like that for lunch and then dinner i'll be at like six and dinner is usually like my big meal and for dinner, I do like tons of roasted veggies. Like we love roasted broccoli, cabbage, um, whatever, a stir fry, and then like chicken thighs or something like that. And then that'll be dinner. And maybe if I do get hungry in between meals, which I usually don't, um, depending on my activity level, I might do a fat bomb. Um, if not, I'll just drink more water with salt. Um, but then I have days where like, especially during my follicular phase in the beginning of my cycle where I'm like straight up carnivorous, which is hilarious. Like I eat like eggs and pate and bacon and I don't want anything else. <laughs> That's awesome. So, I don't, and I, yeah. I love the concept that you bring up because I like to tell people eventually that's the level that you want to get to is this kind of intuitive eating. Um, and very early on for people, it's, it's difficult because a lot of people's intuition challenges them and it's very difficult that willpower to – to be like, wait, I don't eat breakfast or I'm not eating breakfast or I shouldn't have a snack in between my period. Like there, it's kind of like we've been in the program to these habits that people kind of have to break sort of. So I love that. And I'm, I'm right there with you. Like some days I will do the same thing, like wake up in the morning fast, have like a, a lighter lunch and then have dinner. And then on the weekends, usually I'm like hungrier in the morning and I'm like, cool, it's perfect time to make some like keto pancakes or keto waffles or something right. like I, I I love that concept um you have so, you're like the expert when it comes to making all these different recipes and creations but if you had to pick one um one of your favorite foods what would that be like if it was like you know what I had one last meal this this is it what would that look like um so lately I'm like loving 
this recipe on my blog. It's like a teriyaki noodle bowl. Um, mm. And so the, the meat, but it was meatballs, but the meatballs are like ground beef mixed with avocado and like all this citrus. And so they're like really like juicy and creamy. And then the noodles are those shirataki noodles, which are great because they're like no carb practically. And then with crispy Brussels sprouts, because I have this theory where like all vegetables are better burned pretty much. <laughs> like if you, want, <laughs> if you don't like vegetables, seriously burn them, like roast them in the oven until they're like charred and then they're delicious. That's hilarious. And then I make it... To, for real, I'm, it worked at my kid. My my five year old will eat anything green as long as it's crispy. So smart kid. Um, and then the teriyaki sauce, which is like my pride and joy. I love this recipe. So people are always like, I don't use thickeners, right? You can't use starches on keto, and I don't use them. And I don't do like nut meals really. Um, so what do you thicken sauces with? And I don't do heavy cream because I don't do dairy. So I actually bloom coconut aminos in gelatin. And make like this solid mass. And then I dissolve that into some reduced um, bone broth. And it becomes a glaze. So you're getting this glazy, thicker sauce, but it's made with gelatin. And so this meal is packing tons of protein, good fat, fiber, and it tastes like your favorite takeout. It's so good. Oh, my gosh. I'm, I'm like drooling just thinking about this. I, I need to make that soon. And, um, it, and it's actually a pretty easy recipe. Like, it's multi-step, but it can be done in, like, 20 minutes. And, like, people are just loving it on the blog. And I love watching people make it because I'm, like, that's the kind of recipe where you make it a few times, you master that technique, and you can apply it to, like, different sauces and whatever you want. Exactly. And that's why I love, like, some – I've been making some of the ones that you actually put out that are on your blog because you have ones where people, like – some people actually really enjoy cooking. Like, like I know people that love cooking, but then people like me, I'm like, I want to be able to do that, but I want to be able to do it in 20 minutes. So like, that's like, right. so it's like, all right, you have both. So you kind of cater to both. And I love right. that. Um, do you, you said a little bit, you do some sort of like intermittent fasting. You feel better when you kind of do, do you do straight intermittent fasting or do you more, do more of like a fat fast? I mostly do a fat fast, but because it's just, but how I feel my best randomly though, and this goes back to the intuitive eating, I will go like 20 hours without eating sometimes. Um, and that usually follows if I do do a carb up, which like I said, I didn't do, I didn't for a while when I first started keto because of the program I was on and then I dropped them organically. Um, but then when I started doing really heavy lifting, I just feel, and I don't do them necessarily after I lift. It's weird. I just, I, it's usually the day after, like not the day I, I would lift weights, but the day after, like that night for dinner, I'm like insatiable unless I get some carbs. And then the day after my carb ups, I like don't eat. And it's, that says two things to me. One, that I'm not really insulin resistant anymore, which is great because before you told me two years ago, if I had even half a sweet potato for dinner, I could not stop eating the next day. But now after a carb up, my body's like using that so efficiently that I'm just like not hungry afterwards so that's usually when my longer fast happen that's so interesting and so your approach and i see this a lot with people that i've talked to is like you my, even with me like my approach with keto eating um has definitely shifted um and the more and more i become adapted so for you is your shift mainly you incorporate in some carb ups now that you're extremely fat adapted is that kind of one mm -hmm. of the major shifts and are there any other shifts that you've changed um, absolutely. I mean, I'm not like obsessive about it <laughs> anymore. I think at the beginning there was this fear of like, oh my God, I'm going to get kicked out of ketosis. And, um, I was like scared of like vegetables, but I, I realized that living with that, like sense, like that anxiety with food, like that's not a lifestyle, you know? And I, I, I knew that to make this a lifestyle, to make it for the long haul, like I was talking to Vanessa Spina the other day and she's like, would you ever see yourself not doing low carb or keto. And I'm like, no, cause that would be like living my life hungover, you know, like not being fat adapted would feel like a hazy. So I see, I feel like one of the major shifts was really focused, going from being macro focused to being nutrition focused. Like I really, really focus on nutrient density. I'm a huge proponent of like organ meat and awful. Um, I love my green veggies. And I get it. Not every day I'm not going to eat a vegetable. Sometimes that happens. People, like, even some days I'll skip my vegetables because who knows? Like I said, I fast. I'm not hungry. I eat, like, liver that day, whatever. But um, I see that this wave of keto evolving where people are going from the 
like almost like carb phobia to like, hey, if I'm fat adapted and I'm in ketosis and I'm a super active person, maybe I can even eat up to 80 grams of carbs one day and still be in ketosis because I did CrossFit. Like, that's cool, man. Like, it doesn't it doesn't have to look like one way. We can all we can enjoy keep like being in ketosis and metabolic flexibility. And it's going to look different for everybody. Love, love, love that. And I completely agree. I, I think so often people get hung up on, oh, because people will be like, well, you need to be 75% fat, 5% carbohydrate, 20% protein. I'm like, that's not the case. Because like, it depends. Are you eating 1,500 calories? Are you eating 3,000 calories? Are you working out? Are you not working out? Like, I can't give you a blanket recommendation and say, this is what you should eat every day. So I love that. I love that. Right. No, and if we ate the same thing every day, our body would quickly be like, man, this isn't working anymore. Exactly. Like, our bodies like to keep it on. It's, <laughs> it's too boring. Yeah. And so one of the things, and I know you mentioned this on your blog and in your book, um, is food triggers. Like, how, how, would, how do you deal with food triggers? And, like, what's something that, like, you would recommend to people? Say they see something and they're like, oh, my gosh, like, Oreos or something. And they see all these, like, triggers that are, like, should I just do that? Like, what are some of your takeaways? So I have two types of food triggers. There's one, there's inflammatory food triggers. So there's foods that I can eat or like I, I, I choose not to eat because they cause inflammation, right? And you would think that that would be like a hard no for people, but you'd be surprised. People still eat stuff. Right. Even though it makes them feel like crap. But I think that that goes to like once you're operating at your full potential, you those foods quickly become not worth it, right? For me, that list unfortunately includes tomatoes and potatoes and eggplant and all that stuff, which I don't cook with anymore. But um, emotional food triggers, and that's something that I think that this is where traditional or conventional diet dogma or whatever you want to call it gets to, because they tell you you have to moderate. You can eat whatever you want, like a la Weight Watchers, right? Yeah, sure, you can have your pizza, but you can only have one slice. Listen, people, if you ever had binge eating or any kind of eating disorder, you know that that's not the case. No one just has one slice of pizza. So I've learned this about myself. I am not a moderator. I am an abstainer. So I there's like there's certain keto foods that I don't eat. Like everyone's like, you should get an ice cream maker. I'm like, hell no, I'm not getting an ice cream maker because – Yes, it might be keto ice cream, but when you're eating keto ice cream every day, it ceases to be healthy. So <laughs> I just don't buy an ice cream maker because I love ice cream. That's like one of my trigger foods. Like it's not a cup of ice cream. It's not a bowl of ice cream. It's the pint or it's nothing. So I just don't get ice cream. Like, sorry, Halo Top. Not buying it. Not buying it. <laughs> That's hilarious. And, you know, Sean and I uh, on a previous episode, we talked about this. And literally the industry does this on purpose. Like um, and for a lot of – carbohydrate or sugar rich foods like they're designed to make it so you don't just eat one and so that's why i'm like i feel the same way there's certain things that people are like oh just just have a little bit of this or just have that in my right i'm like if i have one oreo or if i have one chips ahoy cookie like that whole sleeve is going down like there's no stopping me at that point right. i love right. it right and, and i think that with a lot of these with a lot of these foods like and to go as far as even, let's say, keto treats, right? So I think that that's a whole other animal. But if people have emotional issues with food, I think you have to tread carefully. because, And that's another reason like, why Whole30 was a big part of like my, my startup. Like I think you can fall into yo-yo dieting habits with any kind of program like that. But if you're someone that you binge on regular bread, chances are you're going to binge on keto bread too. So like while that's a better option and maybe that works for you during your transition, the point is always to A, break away from those habits because they're not, it's not that they're physically necessarily, they're emotionally unhealthy because you're always going to feel that weird guilt afterward, right? And you don't want to have guilt associated with food because that's like crazy talk. So I'm big on um, just be honest with yourself. Like we love to lie to ourselves about food. Like it's our favorite pastime, like humans and food and like, and because we've been to talking about conventional wisdom and medicine and the food industry, they like poison you and then they make you feel guilty about it. You know, it's crazy. It's like hardwired. And so kind of going, you mentioned it a little bit with uh, your intake and I, I'm curious to get your opinion on this because you have a background with autoimmune disease is I see a lot of people now in the industry are going towards this like carnivore like pure carnivore approach, like completely getting rid of vegetables. Like what's, what's your thought on that? Yeah. 
Good Lord. I have a lot. Um, <laughs> so first, when I first saw that, I was like, oh my God, what's wrong with people? Um, so this is the thing. I think that if you're coming from the standard American diet and you're someone who doesn't like vegetables and you're like, oh my gosh, I went keto and I feel great and I can eat like pepperoni cheese pizzas and fathead dough all day and I'm losing weight, whatever. And you, maybe you're seeing results and then you stop seeing results and you see someone on Instagram like doing, keto, doing carnivore keto and you start doing carnivore keto and you feel amazing. Well, of course you feel amazing because all of a sudden you're not eating all this dairy and you're not eating like all these sweeteners and you're probably eating less processed foods, right? Because if you're doing like diet Dr. Pepper and stuff like that, it's like an elimination diet. Like carnivore keto is like a massive elimination diet. But this is the thing. It's not that vegetables are bad for you. It's that some vegetables are probably bad for you. Like, I can't eat vegetables. I know this because there are vegetables that I don't eat because they are bad for me. All vegetables have anti-nutrients, right? There's lectins, there's slonine, like phytic acids. A lot of all plant-based food has its own defense mechanism, right? So I, if you're eating tons of raw veggies, you're probably going to have some digestive distress. Like cooking our food, slow cooking it, soaking it, all these things help break down foods and make them easier to digest. Our ancestors have been doing this forever. That's why fermented food is so good for you. So for me, if you're going to do carnivore keto, fine, but do it properly and do a proper reintroduction protocol. Because if you're going to go from carnivore keto to slam in like whatever, you know, XYZ processed food, of course you're going to think you feel better on carnivore keto because you're not eating that food that's probably harming you. But I think vilifying all vegetables is a dangerous game to play. I'm, I'm definitely there with you. And I think uh, I, I see like, oh, let's just go to Wendy's or McDonald's and get like like the Big Macs without buns. And like that's what they're eating for every meal. And I'm like, I don't think that's really what we're trying – what people are trying to accomplish with the carnivore thing. Like you need to get in the liver and all these organ meats. Like those are essential. And fish. And, and seafood fish. and that right. and most people and that's another thing like i think oftentimes people influencers in the health food i need to be very careful with what they're doing because you're going to apply something to you you're going to apply something and you're going to do it and you're going to but then your followers are going to want to do it too but if you're not extremely first of all transparent and honest with how you're doing it what are you supplementing with how many hours of sleep like our organ meat sourcing grass fed, then you're going to lead people astray and they're going to go to Wendy's getting double burgers saying they're doing carnivore and they're going to eat themselves into like illness because that's highly inflammatory food. And it defeats the purpose of doing a carnivore elimination diet. So I have like, I just feel like it needs to be, that's the kind of thing that maybe you want to do with a doctor, like find a nutritionist or a functional medicine doctor talk to them about it and have them lead you. And also if you can afford to, to source pastured protein, like I don't think if you're going to get grain fed, it's not, it might not be the best choice. Like you really have to focus on nutrient density and anti-inflammatory food, like proteins. So completely, completely agreed. Um, what tips would you have for someone just starting out? They're, they're just like, they've heard of this. They heard, Halle Berry's into it. They heard. They heard that she's she's coming on. They, they've heard all these people. They're like, you know what? I want to get started. What tips would you have for someone? I would say you have to find a book, a person, a nutritionist, somebody that really speaks to you and that you trust, and then stick to them until you are fat adapted. Because if you go just Google keto right now, you're gonna get a shitstorm of ideas, of opinion. It's left. It's right. So do your research and be like, hey, who's who's like who knows their stuff, right? Who's legit? Who's not out here just trying to like, you know, like right now on Facebook, I don't know why it's all over my feed. And I don't even know this person's name, but they're like selling their like protein powders or like their whatever shakes. And they're like, this guy's ripped and he's in the kitchen making these, you know, whatever. And it's like, but they but they market this stuff as like nutrition advice videos. So you're going to see someone at, like so if you're going to go keto, there's a lot of noise out there. So find a person that you trust, find a, a you know, a, a, a blog page or a cookbook author, a nutritionist that is credible and then stick to their program and block out the rest of the noise and don't question everything. Wait till you're fat adapted, just follow the program, ask them for help. And then after that, you can tweak as needed to make it work for you. But people, they go to the keto flu or they hit a stall. And next thing they know, they're like Googling like crazy and they're kind of like the Goldilocks of like keto approaches and they're, and I'm all for troubleshooting, but not in two weeks, 
Like you have to give it the old, you know, try before you say it didn't work, you know? Agreed. Agreed. So I tell advice. people this. I tell people this all the time. I think that's that's great advice. I think I tell people I say, "Listen, you've been feeding your body a certain way for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Don't expect it to completely transform in 7 days." Like like give it some time. Give it a good try. Um, yeah. what are some tips? So you're you're the perfect idea because a lot of people have they're like, you know what? Well, I'm cooking for a family, so it's 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 so difficult. Like, I don't want to cook like this. But like, you have a son and a husband. Like, how does how does that factor in? What are some tips that you can have for like cooking for your family? Okay, so one thing is, don't like just be. You have to kind of just get used to the idea that there's going to be food in your house that you're not gonna that you don't eat. Like, I don't like my my husband doesn't do keto. He's um. I mean, he's in very good shape, honestly. But he's a sugar burner. He's a long distance cyclist and he's active duty Navy. The man can, like, is shredded, but he eats rice, like, bowls to the face and Ben and Jerry's. And I tell him, like, I'm going to outlive you one day for sure, but he won't change. Right now, he's like, no way, going keto. He's like, if I, if I transition to keto, the, the three month transition period is going to, like, kill my cycling. I, I don't want to do it. I'm like, all right, whatever. And so. What I mostly do for them is keep them on like a 60, like 60, you know, like 60% grain free. I try and say, let's do 60% grain free, gluten free for your health reasons, boys, right? So I do a lot of like, um, I don't know, I'll bake some root vegetables for them or make some potatoes for them or I'll make, you know, gluten free pasta or white rice cooked in bone broth. And I make things like that like in big batches so they have their starch. So when it comes dinner time, I make my veggies and I make my protein and I make, you know, I have my fat, which is a sauce or avocado. And then we all eat protein and veggies and fat because guess what? Everyone needs to eat that stuff. Even your kids have them eat their protein, have them eat their veggies, and then they can add their little scoop of starch or whatever, how many portions they want. And that way I'm not at this constant battle with them because come on, any mom knows come dinner time, your kids are already acting a fool. The last thing you want is like a screaming match at the dinner table. And I don't want this and I don't like this. Both my son and my husband don't have metabolic damage. They don't have autoimmune diseases. Like, I'm super fortunate. My son, he ha he's never even been on antibiotics. The kid is like, talk about my childhood that was one way. He's five years old. He's never been sick. He's, a, he's an oak tree. But, you know, I breastfed him forever and all that stuff. So I put in the work. <laughs> and yeah. that's, that's how we make it work in my house. You don't have to – not everyone's going to be on plan with what you're doing. But a great way to get them to eat how you're eating is to lead by example, right? So even my son will say it. Like, he'll, so my son asks sometimes, "Mommy, does this have sugar in it?" You know, or like, "Is this does it, is this gluten?" He'll tell me, and like he doesn't know. Like his ice cream is like frozen banana that I blend for him, and like when he's cookies, he eats my keto cookies, and so there's. We've all like elevated our way of eating, even though I was actually just going to put on Instagram today, like dinner last night. I had zoodles, grilled chicken and roasted broccoli. And the boys had gluten free pasta with roasted broccoli and roasted chicken. And they both we all had the same very free pesto. And that's that was our dinner. And it wasn't a big deal. And they have some leftover today. And, you know, easy peasy. Don't complicate. I love it. I love it. Don't complicate it. Uh, what excites you in the space and as far as where keto, when you first came into keto to where it is now, like what's exciting to you in the space? What's super exciting to me is, like you said, it's evolving. A lot of us, a lot of people have been doing this for a long time now. And once people are fat adapted, it's moving into that intuitive eating space. And what I love about that space is that for me, the message I'm getting, it's like, it's just one big ancestral health movement, which is really what keto should be. And I think that when I first started keto, I was talking to Sean Reiner about this keto for women. It was like, I was kind of in the keto closet because I was eating this low, I would call it low carb paleo because I was like, well, I don't know that keto diet, those people eat weird stuff and it's processed. And I don't know if I'm going to, I, I don't eat that way. I eat paleo, but I kind of see paleo and keto in the same circles. Like I think that as keto evolves, and people are realizing like, hey, it's not just for weight loss, it's for health. This is forever. This is for good. We got to eat real food. There's The lines are blurring. And I love that. I love that. Me too. I love that. Um, one last thing I want to segment into this. I think I want to talk a little bit about your book. And one of the things that you put in there, you're like, people, people say I'm like MacGyver meets Julia Child. I'm like... 
This is um, this is the most amazing analogy. I was like, this probably fits you so perfectly. Um, one of the before we get into that, you just made a transition in your life. You moved from Hawaii to Virginia. Um, anything with food choices? Is there anything that's different that you've already noticed? I know you've only been there for a little a little bit, but like cooking or food choices or access to different food items. Like, was there anything that's drastically different other than the prices of of food in Hawaii versus prices <laughs> yeah. in Virginia? Anything different? So the yeah, the biggest thing is avail availability. Like I can the minute I moved here, I started ordering butcher box and I started <laughs> um oh my god, I love my butcher box. And I started getting like a CSA delivered to my house. I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't have to leave my house. I get farm fresh eggs, vegetables and grass fed beef to my door. Like how convenient. And honestly it comes out I did the math with my the, I get the big butcher box plus my seasonal roots veggie box. And it comes out to 175 a week for grass fed veggie, grass fed beef, organic veggies and pastured eggs to my door to feed a family of three. That's insane. Like I was spending a small fortune in groceries in Hawaii. Um, downfall, there's a lot, there are a lot more options. Like in Hawaii, it, like it was easier to stay home and like just cook at home because when we left the house, we'd be like on a hike or in the beach or like in nature. We're here being in the city and there's like the strip malls and the restaurants and there's always places to eat. Um, a lot of consumerism, I feel. It's like really weird. I'm like, it's still getting used to it. Like all the malls, like why are the malls packed all the time? <laughs> um, but so I feel like I understand people being tempted, I guess, by that a little bit. Like where I felt like in Hawaii, I was kind of isolated. Um, so there wasn't as much of a pool. Um, so I can see that. I can see that being like for people who are on the mainland or live in this kind of city all the time that it can be difficult because yeah, it's like, every, like there's a Panera and there's a noodle house and there's a ramen place. And I'm just like, I know I can't get any of these joints. Like not even right. going to try. So it's like, it's like you have the good, the pros and the cons in a sense that like you understand like, Hey, now I have access to some of these things like grass fed beef, organic eggs, like that are a lot more available to me versus now you mm -hmm. have a ton of, temptation so it's it's this battle I was recently giving a talk in Chile and I was talking about and they were like I was talking about all these different keto friendly items that we have in the US and I was talking about coconut oil and all these different I was even talking about coconut oil and they were like yeah we like really don't have like MCT oil isn't a thing here like we have coconut oil but it's super expensive and very rare and I'm like wow we are so lucky to be able to have that like mm -hmm. access to that where people in Chile are trying to live this lifestyle and I'm like I'm like oh you just throw some MCT oil in your coffee or do or throw some and they're like yeah we really don't have that I was like Woof, what? okay all right let's figure this out <laughs> so it's, it's completely yeah. different no it is different I mean and even just the groceries like in Hawaii the only like health food store was like Hawaii we're here there's like a Wegmans and it's just like it's crazy because it's huge I was if I mean like, we went there yesterday we're like oh my gosh it's like Whole Foods meets Costco it's enormous <laughs> um and there's there's just a lot of options but I definitely think at the end of the day you have to commit to eating at home more or preparing your own food with this lifestyle like it's what's going to make it doable for the long run because you're either going to pay out of pocket because you're buying prepared foods or convenience foods, or you're going to pay it with time, which means getting out of the kitchen and cooking it yourself because it's not going to make itself people. <laughs> Someone's got to make the food. And I think it's such an important piece that we've tended to overlook due to today's like, uh, all we're bombarded with social media and all these different things. Like one of the things that I loved so much about growing up in like an Italian family, like it was, it was culture, part of our culture to like eat dinner, like actually sit down, turn the TV off, no cell phones and like have a conversation with each other. Like that doesn't, it's like, Oh, well I'm, I'm going to make Johnny's little dinner here. And then the husband's dinner gets, is on the rush there. And like people don't sit down and like, have that that right. kind of culture and that bonding experience. And I think food can be that bonding experience, and getting in the kitchen is the first way to do that. So I love that you're kind of absolutely bringing that back, bringing that back. And definitely, so, some people are like, yeah, go ahead. No, I was gonna say. So with that, like with, with being cooking in the kitchen, like you're with your son and your husband, like this whole Julia Child meets MacGyver concept. Um, you are the epitome of someone who can take anything and make a recipe from it. Like, what is your approach with that? Where did that come? Like, you didn't go to intense schooling for this to like try and figure out food. Like, what did that come from? 
So I think a lot of it, it came out of necessity, honestly. And I think that I'm someone that um, I have a theory that hardships, they're like the seed for creativity and for everything. I mean, I know people like, like an easy life. It's like nothing comes out of an easy life. And I think like, like this, going back to my parents, like when you need to get something done, when you need to do something or need to create a meal and you're like, Oh my gosh, there's like only five foods that I can eat right now that makes me feel good. You're going to figure it out because you got to eat. And in general, my have been a lot, like a lot about that. I think also working on a food truck, let me tell you some pretty ghetto cooking situations. <laughs> so, uh, and, and like, and that's one of the things that I think where my restaurant experience really plays in um, to my cooking methods and style versus like sometimes maybe other bloggers who just like that, they're home chefs and super talented. But when you cook in a commercial level, like literally feeding 150 people out of a food truck with like a two man team, you create, you adapt and you acquire some skills and some methods for cooking things. It's really creative and out of the box. Like, um, I've been doing this for a long time and, even when I was vegan, so I was vegan for a while, like a long time ago, mm. I did all the things. And I've always loved to play around with food. I, I'm not scared. And like, I'm not scared of weird, I mean, my people know this about my recipes uh, on my blog, my followers, they're hilarious because there's so many comments on recipes like, this one looks super weird, Christina, but like, I trust you. So I tried it and oh my God, it's amazing. <laughs> but when you look at a lot of my recipes, you're like, you do, you say, what, what's in there? But I, I've learned that instead of focusing on replacing foods, right? Because if you're just going standard American diet and replacing them with keto fied versions of it, you're kind of always going to be left meh because it's never going to be as good, right? So instead, I think about flavor profiles, like how are our taste buds going to react? Like what are like what are the craving, the umami and something, the sweet, the savory, the textures that we're really craving and recreate them in like outside of the box ways. So you're eating this meal that's hitting all those notes all those flavor profiles and, and satisfying those cravings without it being some keto version of something else. I love scientific yet super practical. I love it. I yeah. love it. So what else, what can people expect? So you wrote this book made whole. Uh, I love it. I have it here. Um, what can people expect in this book? What are some of the things that you really tried to allow people to take away? So one of the things is that I'm not, the book doesn't like, a manual. Um, don't read it saying like, oh my gosh, I want someone to tell me how to fix my life because no one can tell you how to do that. So the book is empowering you to fix your own damn life. <laughs> so that's what the book does. I, that's my biggest takeaway. I want to empower the reader to read it and through reading it, through reading my story and the troubleshooting methods, I talk a lot about figure it out. Like, don't be scared troubleshoot like what's the worst that can happen like literally if gaining a few ounces of water weight or whatever because you ate something one day like don't be around don't be scared to play around with your macros don't be scared to play around with the foods that you're you know reintroducing um don't be scared to get in the kitchen and have fun i really really want to empower the reader that's the number one thing like i opened the book with a you know quote like i'm not going to give you the fish i'm going to teach you how to fish um, cause the book is really empowerment for troubleshooting and figuring out your own path to help Two, teaching you how to cook. If you don't know how to cook, that book will really walk you through some methods. Like that's, that's me. I have a whole kitchen. There you go. I have a whole <laughs> kitchen intuition section, which is like all my tips and tricks in the kitchen. Plus even each recipe, the way I wrote the instructions is to really walk you through the process. So you don't, you're not left being like, huh? Hey. Um, and then the last thing I think people are going to take away from the book is that you can eat in a way that nourishes your body, that feels really, really good, and you're really going to enjoy what you're eating. Like, you're not going to focus on, what do you mean I'm not eating nuts or dairy or grains or gluten or sugar? Who cares? Who cares about those foods? They don't exist. You're eating What you're eating and what's in front of you is so amazing, you won't even be thinking about that stuff. That's so true. I love it. I love it. So what else, um, just so the listeners can hear, other than being in the kitchen making all these incredible recipes and crushing it, uh, what else do you like to do in your spare time? Like what do you do? Spend time with your kid and your husband when you can? What else? Yeah. So we love hanging out together. One of the things we do a lot is we go on like hikes and bike rides. Um, my five-year-old's really active and he's a beast on his little bicycle. I and mean, he'll go five, six miles. So we go out together on trails. Um we love doing that, and and we love going to, like, we just love nature trails. We take our dog with us, 
Um, so we like being outside. We're definitely very active people. That's one thing in Hawaii we fell in love with. You know, it just reconnects you. It grounds you. makes everyone in a better mood. Um, and I love I love dancing, like going out dancing. I don't do it as much as I used to, but I am Cuban. And so <laughs> I love good music. So even if I might not be at the club, like even just going to a Zumba class, like I am not a cardio girl. I'm a, I like lifting heavy weights. Cardio makes me sad. But I, I'll go to like a Zumba. If, since I can't go out like partying all night, I like seriously go to a Zumba class and I get like my dose of Pitbull and I'm good. <laughs> That's good. I love that. I love that. Yeah. What else? What else uh, is in the pipeline for you? I know you're about to go on a, a little tour across the U.S. Yes. What else? What else? Yeah, along more. with the blog and anything else new in the pipeline? Yeah, definitely. So I, I realize that when we talk about a little bit about this, like helping people, right? Really connecting with people. That is like my favorite thing to do even more than cooking is that that feeling when I truly help people and because of my own experiences I'm getting a lot of people that are coming to me with very specific like questions and needs and they want my advice because they my story speaks to them so I'm going to enroll this fall in the nutritional therapy association um, program to get my NTP so I can officially help people um, so I want to start a coaching practice you know nutritional um, coaching. And it's great because here in Virginia, there's a really good scope of practice for that. Um, and I'd like to do one-on-one -on -one with clients. And so that hopefully will launch next fall. And along with that, I would love to write another book. So I have to talk to my publisher about this. But I, I, once I realized that the AIP, the autoimmune protocol or elimination diet based in the keto world, there's a big overlap right now. There's a lot of people who know they do better on keto or on a ketogenic template but can't do eggs or nuts or seeds or dairy or nitrates or have other inflammatory issues that they're troubleshooting. And I'm one of the few people right now filling that space. Um, so Made Whole has 117 AIP compliant recipes or with modifications um, out of the 150. Yeah, and I'd like to write a fully AIP keto book, like maybe a smaller book. And, a, and in the heart of what we talked about with carnivore, which I think I will touch upon in that book, like how to do it properly. I want to talk about reintroductions and have like a play-by-play. -play. Like week one, reintroduce this, this is how you do it. Week two, introduce this, this is how you do it. Um, to really walk people through the process. Love that. And congratulations. I think that's a great idea. I think um, going back and getting that, I think you're definitely going to be able to help people, especially with the one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, that's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. So we're coming up here on the close. Um, I don't want to keep you too long. I know you got a ton of still uh, figuring out the logistics of Virginia and everything going on. But where can people I, find you? Um, where can they find you? Uh, the blog, your social media, all that stuff. Yeah. So the blog page is thecastawaykitchen.com. And the blog has like over 150 free recipes. And the recipes range from like keto to paleo, whole 30 to autoimmune protocol, everywhere in between. There's a lot of resources and articles on there, meal plan, um, and that's just always there, always free, which is free for people. And on Instagram, I'm really active. I'm always cooking on stories and answering questions, and that's at the Castaway Kitchen. Um, more recently, I'm doing some, like, YouTube videos, which are just super casual. Like, usually when I get a few questions about something, I'll just jump on there on a live and kind of talk about it. And, um, yeah, so Facebook, too, like any social media handle at the Castaway Kitchen. And I'm really active on social media. I found it's a really good platform to connect with people and help them and inspire them, you know? Amazing. And the book launches what day? Ju oh, my gosh, July 17th. So, July like, 17th. coming up. Real soon. Yeah. And they can get it on Amazon and... Uh, where else? Barnes & Noble, Target, um, any any online store. Like, so, obviously, on Amazon's the big one, but barnesandnoble.com, target.com as well, um, and it'll be in stores everywhere July 17th, like at your local bookstore, um, and I'm starting my book tour in Miami, then Seattle, then San Francisco, then Dallas, and ending in Arlington, which is super great, um, and I'm really excited. I hope people come see me out in book tour. I'm a lot of fun in person. I give hugs, so be warned. <laughs> Free hugs. Love it. Love Free it. hugs. Well, got yes. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. It's so great. I, I'm so great. glad I got to finally meet you in person, and I've been following all of your stuff. So thank you so much, and uh, definitely keep yeah. me posted with the book tour and, and how everything's going with the book, and I definitely will be following along every step of the way. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan, for having me. Thank you.